there, Adrian Rosebrock here from PyAmageSearch.com, and today we're going to be talking about Siamese networks. And this is a introductory uh, series on Siamese networks. Today we're going to talk about the concept of image pairs in Siamese networks. Next week we'll dive into training and implementing a Siamese network architecture. And then the last tutorial in this series will show you how to actually use that Siamese network and make predictions using it. Siamese networks, man, these are some of the coolest architectures in computer vision and deep learning. I love them so much because of their power and their utility and in ways their their simplicity. And we can make them as simple, as advanced as we want. We'll be starting with some simple ones based off of image pairs. And then in the future series, I'm gonna do an advanced series on Siamese networks. And then we're gonna start discovering like triplet images, triplet loss, contrast of loss, all of the and more advanced Siamese network algorithms and techniques. But just like anything else, you have to start with your your basics first. You need to build a strong foundation. You need to understand the true underlying fundamentals, and then you could start building up. And that doesn't mean you have to understand the theory or the mathematics. No, far from it, even though that can certainly help. But I'm saying start with your lower level implementation first. Implement simple, basic networks. Understand how they work, and then we can move to more to a more advanced techniques. So without further ado, let's start this tutorial at a bit of a higher level, discuss what Siamese networks are and why you may use them. I have an example here. This was pulled from uh, the Wikipedia page on Siamese twins or conjoined twins, and this is where Siamese networks actually got their name. In conjoined twins, it's a rare birth phenomena where twins are actually born conjoined together, typically around the hip or waist region. Some of these twins live and can be separated, some of them cannot, but the, the point here is that they're born together, joined together, they have their own separate you know, brains and, and minds, but typically they may share their lower intestinal tract, a liver, a kidney, organs like that. And that's, again, it's a naturally occurring phenomena. It doesn't, it happens extremely rarely, but that is the general premise of you have two individual entities that are connected biologically in some manner. So what one input does or what one person does and what this other input do, they can impact the general organs, they can impact the general structure of the two people. So with that said, let's take a look of an example of a Siamese network. And here we have this network called Signet, it has been designed for signature recognition, so making or signature ver verification, so that when a signature is input to these networks, the goal is that for the network to say, yes, this signature is real, or no, this signature is fraudulent, it doesn't belong to the same person. You know, someone else tried to attempt to forge that person's signature. And here you have the, the same concept, right? So just like your conjoined tw uh, twins have two heads, this are the two heads of our input. The one input has a signature as an input and so does the other head. These are again, two separate signature images. Whether or not they were done by the same person, that is something the network is going to decide. But keep in mind, these are two individual inputs to the network. Then we have our, our bodies. These may be called subnetworks or they may be called sister networks or they might just be called module networks, whatever term in the literature. I like sister networks because I think that goes nicely with the conjoined twins analogy. But these are two separate independent architectures, or there are two separate models. However, and this is the big caveat with Siamese networks, is that the architecture itself is identical on both bodies. So if this layer is learns 96 convolutional filters, so does this one. And if this one learns 256, so does this one. And if this one has a fully connected node with 1024, so does this one. But there's an additional caveat. Besides these two networks having the same architecture, their weight updates are identical as well. So it's not just that the architectures are the same and that this layer has 96, will learn 96 filters and that this layer will learn 96 filters. It's just that the weight updates that happen to this layer are identically going to be mirrored over on this layer as well. So these networks are in a sense conjoined because 
data will basically, the updates will flow back and forth between these networks. So one, one weight gets updated, the other weight gets updated as well. So again, present two images to each head of the Siamese network. Each sister network will perform the, the perform a forward pass. You go back here, you get the output, which is typically a, a dense node over here. Most implementations will implement, implement some sort of distance measuring function, like a Euclidean distance, to measure the distance between um, the outputs of these vectors, and that's fed into a loss function. For basic Siamese networks, you'll typically see binary cross entropy because you're just trying to know, hey, is this signature real or is it a forgery? So that's basically a two-class classification problem. Your more advanced Siamese networks, you'll actually have triplet images, and I'll briefly discuss that in a second. But the general idea is you have a real signature, another real signature, and then a fake signature. And your general idea is to update the weights of your network such that in an n-dimensional embedding space, the two real signatures live closer together, and then the fake signature is farther out here somewhere. So it's away from the real images. It's it, you're learning an embedded space basically. And you might be saying, okay, so what? Are there real world applications of Siamese networks? Yeah, in fact, these tutorials, most of the tutorials on the Pi Research blog that utilize face recognition, they rely on Siamese networks. And I discussed that over here. Here's an example of your essential, your essentially your your triplet learning, where you have your anchor, which is your real, your real image. Uh, your positive image, then you have a positive over here, which is the same class of your anchor, and then you have your negative. In the context of face recognition, let's say like I have my anchor is my own face, I have a positive image, which is my own face, and then we have a negative image, which is someone else's face. We're going to pass all of that through their deep learning architecture. Uh, we're going to compute this L2, which are Euclidean distance, construct our embedding, and then that's passed through our triplet loss. And then the output of which, now look at our and look at our embedding space. Over here, the negative image actually lives closer to the anchor. But over here, the anchor lives closer to the positive image, meaning that if we're talking in face recognition, my face, the anchor, and my face, the positive example, now live closer together in that n-dimensional space. But this negative image over here, while the anchor and positive live over here, my negative is farther out here. There's a larger distance between the two. So we're basically learning and embedding. So we do that. That's this one. This is, I believe, uh, FaceNet. Yep, this is the FaceNet architecture, Siamese network architecture used for uh, face recognition and clustering and similarity detection. And then this one over here is uh, based on ResNet. It's the same idea and it's implemented in the DLib library. And to continue the face recognition example, here you have a photo of Chad Smith and who looks very similar to Will Ferrell. So this is our negative image. This is our positive image of Will Ferrell. And then this is our anchor image of Will Ferrell. Our neural network during inference is gonna make a prediction and generate a 128 dimensional vector that quantifies each of these faces. And then we're going to compare the results and then tweak the weights of the network such that the embeddings produced by your positive image and your anchor image live closer together in that n-dimensional space. And then this picture of Chad Smith lives farther out there. So that's more advanced applications of face recognition, especially with Siamese networks. That gets into triplet loss and contrastive loss and uh, triplet training. You have other forms of... Siamese networks that are used for signature verification and recognition. So again, detecting a real signature versus a forged signature. One of my favorite applications of Siamese networks is actually prescription pill identification. In the United States alone, there's over 20,000 prescription pills on the market, and over half of which are round and or white. So over 10,000 pills in the market are round and or white. That's a lot of visually similar pills that is, and it's near impossible to OCR pills. So you have to learn how to quantify and represent a pill based off of an image alone. And actually Siamese networks can help with that because again, it can tweak the weights of the network to learn, is this a, is this a Tylenol? Are these two images Tylenols? Yes, no. Or is this some other, is this a Motrin or, you know, or, B vitamin or something else. You will see Siamese networks alert used in a ton of tasks regarding verification 
and recognition. You also see them uh, for similarity search. I've seen a lot of work in content-based image retrieval, CBIR, that uses Siamese networks so that when you input a, like a, a photo of an ocean or a beach scene, the results returned from the network are images that are similar to that beach or ocean scene. But let's, we're getting a little ahead of ourselves because we're not going to be talking about triplet losses and triplet images. We're going to be talking strictly about uh, the concept of image pairs. So when we go to train this neural network, we need to understand what a positive pair is and a negative pair. A positive pair is two images that belong to the same class. In the context of digit recognition, here we have an example of an eight on the left, an example of an eight on the right. That is a positive pair because they both belong to the eight class. Over here, we have a negative pair. And these are negative because on the left, you have a six and on the right, you have an eight. These are negative pairs because these two images do not belong to the same class. When we train our Siamese network, the goal here is to learn how to predict if two input images belong to the same class or not. We're using the MNIST digit example here because it's simple, it's straightforward, it's built into Keras and TensorFlow, it's easy to work with and understand, easy to train networks on, but you can apply this to face recognition as well. So you could have my face here and another example of my face here, that's a positive pair. But if you put my face here and some other person's face here, that is a negative pair. But And that's exactly what we need in order to train these Siamese networks. For example, with Signet, you need an input of to uh, of, you need to you need an image pair as an input so this could be a real signature of a person and this could be the forged example of that same person's signature that would be an example of a negative pair or these two images could be from the signature of the same person that'd be a positive pair and our network is going to learn to differentiate between real the real signatures or fake signatures or you could swap out whatever task you want. It could be the same face, meaning face verification, face recognition, or it could be a different face, meaning that face belongs to different people. Those are two different individuals. But training such, training such a network really hinges on our ability to generate these positive and negative pairs. This is the most important data uh, generation or pre-processing step, whatever you want to call it, that you really need to understand for Siamese networks. So that's why I'm dedicating an entire tutorial to, to generate image pairs. And when we do our advanced tutorial on Siamese networks, I'm going to dedicate an entire uh, tutorial on triplet generation because that's the crux of the data processing and data loading and data generation step. Like you cannot train a Siamese network without an understanding of how these image pairs are generated. So at the end of the script, we're going to have something that looks like this. And it's just a visualization of image pair gen uh, generation. So we have positive pairs. Here's a nine and a nine. Here's a positive pair of a zero and a zero. But this is a negative pair because it's a two and a zero. Here's a negative pair because this is a two and that's a seven. Um, that's what is going to be fed into our Siamese network in the following tutorial and next week's tutorial. So today we're just going to focus exclusively on this image pair generation process. So I'm going to open up the directory structure for our project. It's dead simple. We have a build Siamese pairs script, which I've opened up over here in PyCharm. And the crux of this script is going to be the make pairs function, which as you probably guessed by now is responsible for, for generating these image pairs. So let's go ahead and, and dive into the script. We're going to import our packages here. We're going to work with the MNIST dataset because it's easy and it's accessible and it can be easily loaded into memory regardless if you have a CPU or a GPU. And in general, it's just fairly straightforward to train networks on this benchmark data set. You can, have, you can use this function that we're defining here on your own data set. It could be a face recognition data set. It could be a signature verification data set. I'm just using MNIST just out of simplicity to make this a complete, whole, cohesive tutorial. We'll use the build montages function to actually generate uh, this output image here. We have NumPy for, num for numerical processing and then OpenCV for our OpenCV bindings. Let's dive into the make pairs function. This function requires two parameters, one being our images and then two being the labels for those images. And we're going to initialize two, Im two lists here. The first one is going to have our pairs of images. So it's going to be a two tuple of image pairs written in Python and may look something like image pairs equals 
you know, something like that, just a list of two tuples containing images. That's, you know, what this list is ultimately going to be populated as. And our pair labels are going to be something like zero, one, one, where a zero means it's a negative pair and a one means it's a positive pair. So let's go ahead and learn how we're going to generate these two lists. Right here, I'm going to use the NumPy unique function on our labels and then take the length of the resulting list. And what that is going to give me is the unique number of class labels in our data set. So in the MNIST data set, the MNIST digits data set, there are a total of 10 class labels for the digits 0 to 9. And then this line of code, I'm going to expand on it a little bit. But what we're doing here is we're going to loop over the indexes of our number of classes. And I'm going to find all indexes in our labels lists that are equal to the current class label from this for loop. And then I'm going to take all those indexes and then use a Python list comprehension to store them as an index var as a variable. Now this is done as a Python list comprehension for speed and for speed and for uh, efficiency, but it's arguably not the most readable line of code. So what I did before I run this ran this example is I rewrote this loop as uh, inside of a Python shell, so you can see what what we're doing here. So again, I'm going to loop over the total number of unique class labels. I'm going to find the indexes for all class labels equal to our current label up here. So this gives me the indexes into our images and labels list where the labels are currently equal to our if class label. And then I'm going to print out the class label index, the uh, total number, the indexes, the total number of indexes are samples that belong to the if class label and then their indexes themselves. So when you print out this code, this is what it looks like. For class label zero, there's 5,923 data points with a class label of zero. And then list right here are the indexes into images and labels that belong to class label zero. Here's class label one for digit number one, or digit one. There's 6,742 examples of digit one. And here are the indexes that are class label one. And then I repeat this process for each of the 10 possible, 10 possible class labels. So that's all that all this is doing is essentially a lookup list or a lookup dictionary where I, if I want to find all class labels that have, or cl all data points that have a class label of three, all I have to do is specify, oh, okay, I need index three and that's going to return the indexes of all samples that have a class label of three. And that's going to be really helpful when we generate our image pairs. And speaking of which, let's generate our image pairs now. So I'm going to loop over all images in our data set, and I'm going to grab the current images using this index, and I'm also going to grab the current label belonging to this index. Now I'm going to generate my positive pair by randomly picking an image that belongs to the same class label. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use my index list, which we generated up here and we visualized down here. I'm going to pass in the current label and I'm going to get this value back. It's going to be a list of indexes and I'm going to randomly pick one of them. And that is my positive image pair. So I'm going to get a new index by randomly sampling one of these indexes and then I'm going to extract the image associated with it. And then I'm going to update my pair images and pair, able, pair, pair labels list with my positive pair. So this is my current image that I pulled out up here. This is my positive image. And then I'm my, I'm, for my labels list, I'm going to put in a value of one, meaning this is a positive pair. So the positive pair is taken care of. Now we've generated this pair up here. How do we generate a negative pair? And luckily using NumPy, it's actually pretty simple. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to get the, the index of all labels not equal to the current label. So that gives me the indexes of every single class label that is not equal to the current label. So for example, if my current image had a value of zero, so if this label, the current image and the current label is zero, that means I want the indexes to all of these. So this one, I want the set of class labels belonging to the nine labels that are not zero. So 
one through nine, I want those indexes. Randomly sample one of those negative indexes, and that's going to serve as my negative image. And just like we updated our pair images and labels, you know, up here on lines 36 and 37, that's what we're gonna do right here. So we have our current image and our negative image that forms our negative pair. And then our label is a zero because that is our negative pair. And that is how you generate this negative pair down here. We then return a two tuple of our pair images and our pair labels as NumPy arrays to the calling function. And honestly, that's the workhorse of generating pairs for Siamese neural networks. There are, there are more advanced more advanced pair generation techniques, and especially when you get a triplet loss, other, other triplet generation techniques that are, actually use a bit of metrics and learn uh, or inspect the label, expect the, the distribution and kind of pick harder or easier samples. That helps the network learn and enables it to generalize better. But for the sake of image pair generate image pair generation, we'll just keep it simple. We'll build a strong foundation first, and then we'll learn. We'll move on to our more advanced techniques later in a future series. So now that the function is defined, we're going to load our MNEST training data from disk. We got our training data and the labels. We got our test data and our test labels, and then we're going to generate our pairs using our make pairs functions. So right here, I'm passing in my training images, my training labels, resulting in our training pairs and our label, the pairs for those, or the labels for the pairs. And then we do the same thing here, only for our test set. We're gonna pass in our testing images, our testing labels. The result is gonna be our testing pairs along with the labels associated with those pairs. If we were training a Siamese network, what we would do now is we would define the Siamese network architecture, and then we would fit the model. We would pass in our training data and train the network to gener to determine if we're looking at a positive or a negative pair. However, we're just learning the fundamentals right now. We're just generating image pairs. So let's visually validate that we actually created the pairs properly. So I'm going to initialize a list of images. These will be our visualizations, our positive or negative pairs. And then I'm going to loop over a sample of 49 of our training pairs. So that's all that this code is doing. I am generating random indexes in the range of zero to the total number of training pairs, and I want 49 of them, so I'm going to randomly sample 49 of them. For each training pair, I'm going to extract the image, the first image, the second image, and the label here is either going to be one for positive pair or zero for negative pair. And then I'm going to stack the, the two images side by side, so I allocate some memory for it and I use the stack image to stack the image pairs right next to each other. And then I wanna draw the text either NEG for negative or POS for positive. So if the label is equal to zero, that's a negative pair. So I'm gonna write the negative text. Otherwise, this label must be one. So I'm gonna draw the text POS for positive. If we're looking at a negative pair, just for annotation purposes to make it easier on the eyes, I wanna draw the negative text in red Otherwise, I'm going to draw the positive text in green, and you can actually see that in our output here because the negative text is red, positive text is green. In order to actually draw this text on the input image, we actually need to create an RGB or a three-channel image from, our, from these images here. Remember that MNIST is a single-channel grayscale data set, so we can't, there's no concept of this color in grayscale. So what we do is we create a three channel image by stacking the output the output image that we generated here three times. So we have a grayscale image and we stack it three times. We now have an RGB representation of a grayscale image. We then resize the image to make it easier on our eyes so we don't have to squint as we're staring at our screen. We can actually see like the larger resolution version. And then we draw the text which we created up here using the specified color. This visualization image is added to our images list. We then build the montage of example images and then actually execute the script. And speaking of which, let's go ahead and do that now. I'm going to pop open my terminal, grab the usage of the script, run this. We're going to load our MNEST data set from disk. We're going to prepare our positive and negative pairs, which will take a few seconds to do. And then here you have our output. This is a negative pair because it's a six and a one. So that's obviously those don't belong to the same class. So that's a negative pair. Here we have a one and a one. Those images belong to the same class. So it's a positive pair. Here's a three and a four, different classes, negative pair, and so on all the way throughout the rest of this script. 
that's how you generate positive and negative image pairs. As you can see, this line of this this function is pretty straightforward. Like even with comments, it's only 40 lines of code. And thanks to NumPy, it's incredibly simple to implement. But it is the cornerstone of being able to train these basic Siamese networks. So make sure you go through the tutorial associated with it where I do a bit deeper dive into the code. And I also do a bit deeper dive into the fundamentals of Siamese networks. So make sure you read and really digest that introductory content. And then make sure you execute the code as well. Replicate my results. I can't stress this point enough. Be an active learner. It's not enough just to absorb by watching or reading. You need to run the script. You need to look at the code. And if it errors out, you need to learn how to resolve those errors because that's what makes you a good computer vision practitioner. So go through this content, make sure you have a good grasp on it. And then starting next week, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how to use this make pairs function. And then we're going to actually define our Siamese network architecture. You know, similar to what we have Signet here, we're going to define our own Siamese network model and we're going to train it using our pair data. And then finally, two weeks from now, we're going to learn how to use that train model to make a prediction to say, hey, do these two images belong to the same class or not? And that's the point where you're, you can start modifying the, the data set that you train the model on. You could use it for face verification and recognition. You could use it for signature identification. You could use it for, for prescription pill identification. But all of this, and I cannot stress this enough, all of this hinges on your ability to define that make pairs function. So take the time now to really digest it and understand it. Run the code associated with it and inspect the results. And from there, I can't wait to get back to you next week where we'll actually train our Siamese model. So I'll see you then. <laughs>